Hi everyone, welcome back to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton. Uh, really pleased to say that I'm joined by Rob from City Extra again. Uh, Rob, thanks for coming on, mate. You joined me uh, about a month ago, it was, wasn't it, for the league game? Yeah, it was some time. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it was a, it was a good game. Obviously, we've got the three points, so <laughs> hopefully we can get another win this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think there's a lot more pressure on City to win it than us. Uh, we need to win it, but uh, I think a few Evertonians have sort of no, there's a couple of negative Evertonians who've given up hope. But now I'm I'm sticking in there. I'm gonna I'm gonna I reckon we can still we can still pull it out. Um, as well, since the last time I spoke to you, City have actually lost the football match, which was unexpected. So yeah, we'll get onto that a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, horrible, tough one. Um, <laughs> I know I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go on to it because of all the games to lose, that that's got to be the worst. Uh, that or like a cup final, like yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I mean, horrible. Um, but you know, going off that, still a very good side, City. It goes without saying. Um, and you progressed this week against Munch and Gladbach in the in the Champions League, which was a real positive. Um. Be good to see City go the distance this this season because it's definitely something Pep's been striving for for the last five years, really, isn't it? Since he came in. Um, but do you think this is do you think this is City's best chance to take to take it to win the Champions League? Yeah, because I asked you before if you could send the questions over, and then it was <laughs> once finished work, it was the first question I saw. I was like, oh god, no. Because <laughs> all City fans are like, we get it, like we get that it's it is the the crown jewel and everything like. You know, it's, it's the main tournament that you can win at club level. It's difficult to say. It's really difficult to say because I am confident, but they're just a typical, like, cynical City pessimist fan is still there. Like, you can't be just going out about, going about saying that City are going to win the Champions League. You just can't do it. It just no. doesn't compute. Yeah. It. But out of all the seasons, this is one of the best chances we've had since, since Pep's been here and obviously since the takeover naturally like because even when Pellegrini came everyone was thinking that we'd go find the Champions League because he had a good European record mm. and obviously since Guardiola came everyone was like to validate everything to validate the project for lack of a better term to, to validate the club and to the upper echelons of Europe you've got to win Europe and I, I get that I do get that I think just getting past the quarterfinals and getting to semi-final mm. that would be a huge achievement in and of itself but because of the main Spanish teams, well, I know Real Madrid is still in, but because of the, the way it's structured now, there's no fans, and with all the teams that are still in, all of them have frailties, and we're obviously on a really, I know we lost recently, but we're still on a very, very good one, and we have everyone fit, which is not yeah. normal. Usually, we, we have like one or two big injuries. This year, we've got everyone fit, so everyone's fighting for the places, and it's just like, you never know, you never know. But I just think we've got to see what the draw is first because if we get Bayern Munich or we get Liverpool, then I'm just going, oh, for God's sake. Mm. <laughs> They're the two worst. And we're going to come on to it later with United. But we that trying to count, to, to prevent the counter-attacks is one of the main points of Guardiola's play. And I think Liverpool and Bayern, while these are frailties at the back, both in this year, they're so devastating on the counter. And we've done well Count, preventing counter attacks throughout the season, but United showed that they can on a, any given day they can just we can get run over. Like just if you just have a bad day, and the Champions League, it's like as Guay always says, you have one bad game, you don't like um, Leon, obviously. But it was now with two legs, we might have a better chance. But still, you just these teams are so good now, and that's you know we can't expect to get muppets in the quarterfinals of the Champions League but it'd just be, be great if we got Porto that's all I can say yeah <laughs> it's it, it, it's crazy isn't it like the the standard just seems to get higher and higher every year like and then you've got teams that come through and you think oh PSG are going to do it this year and then PSG got to the final last year and Bayern run them over and you're like alright so now Bayern are the best team and then you think but you know Liverpool won it and then Liverpool fall off but you can never count them out Um and then there's like City who is just and it's it's on a different level, Rob. But like you, the way you're talking about the Champions League quarter final is exactly how Everton fans feel about this weekend's game. It's yeah, like it you, you it's like it. It, <laughs> Everton and City fans are so similar in that vein, is that we never expect yeah. anything. <laughs> um because you always end up getting disappointed. It's like, yeah, 
I think, like, especially after the last game against Tottenham, obviously Tottenham nowhere near as good as City, but, um, like, I was like, oh, yeah, after that Tottenham game, I was like, yeah, because we don't usually win those games. Usually the high score and big games that get shown on Sky for years, we always we always get beaten them. Um, and it's like, okay, now, now yeah, I'm dead confident now. Let, let's go get to the semis, let's win it. And then we pulled City out and people are like, oh, well, we can still beat them, we can still beat them. And yeah. ever and ever since we pulled you out, um, it just everything seems to have gone downhill. Like <laughs> Pickford's out, which I'm sure we'll move on to. There's like we've lost a couple of games, and yeah, it feels like the same. It feels like the it, it, on a different level, but the same conversation is that I don't yeah. know if I don't know if I'm I'm confident because we're the underdogs, or if I'm conf- if I'm not confident because we we could get absolutely battered. Um, but like obviously. There's been a lot to happen. Like I, I think you came on, and you remember the uh, the the league game was the seventeenth of last month, and I remember you come on a couple of days before. So much has happened in that time. Uh, like Everton have won the first derby at Anfield, which we both, which you messaged me about as well, which, which was great. Um, <laughs> and then and then obviously City lost that game at, at, at the Etihad against United, which was a real surprise to a lot of people, but. I don't know it, and I've always compared Pep's uh, City teams to like, or any team really. To it feels a bit like a computer. It feels a bit like it when there's these working cogs in the sides, everything works brilliantly. But as soon as one thing goes wrong, the whole thing falls to pieces. And that's yeah. where that's where for me City's weak points are is that if you throw a spanner in somewhere it's reactive with other players. And that was definitely the case against United because United were 2-0 up in the second half with plenty of time left. And, you know, City weren't doing the, the common thing of let's throw players into the box, let's look for another goal to get back in it. It was the same style of play. It was the same style of play that for the last hour of the game had had, had no benefit for City at all and United knew their way around it. But... um does that loss make you more apprehensive for the bigger games coming up this season? Because you've got a very big season now. You've got 10 massive league games. I don't know how many you've got left. I think it's about 10. Um, and obviously the, the Champions Leagues and you're still in the Cup um, and still in the League Cup as well. But, you know, how, does that make you does that make you nervous after that game? Because, you know, we've spoken about it. How Everton and City fans go hand in hand with the worry and the anxiety. Um, has that had an effect on you? Even though you've won all these games, does that one derby? Because it's the worst one to lose, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was the worst one. To, I'm glad I wasn't there. It was just, yeah. I actually missed the derby last year as well because I had a Christmas do and that was an awful game. I watched it with United fans when um, Dan James was running them up and I can just never forgive Angelino for that. Can't be letting <laughs> Dan James run on. Um, yeah, it was, it's one of those, I actually think, a lot's been made of our mentality. And I think this season, we've had that level of mentality to dig deep against you lot, for example. And uh, we'll come on to it in a bit later, that result. Um, but you think that game was sleepwalking to a one-all. And then out of nowhere, which is, I know it's a, it's a great strike for Mares and Everton's midfield is completely vacant. But we still had to dig deep to get that goal out of nowhere. And mm. then there's been other games like that. But I do agree that, there are times over Guardiola's tenure where um, last year's semi-final, for example, against Arsenal, where it was like, we're just doing the same thing. We need to like mix it up. We're just, we're not trying anything new. The only new thing that happened in the derby was when Foden came on. And you're yeah. like, why the hell is this guy been playing the entire game? He's just completely changed it. Like his yeah. dynamism and his verticality. But I do agree. Yeah, when we have a bad day, it's one of them where you're like, Jesus, they're having a bad day. Mm. <laughs> a really bad day at the office. Yeah. That's the worry. That's what we have to hope doesn't happen in the Champions League or in the cup games this weekend and the final against Tottenham because it, it can go really wrong, can go south quite quickly. But I, I'm i always apprehensive about counter-attacks because that is the fundamental flaw with how high we play. And mm-hmm. while we're not we're like the eighth best pressing side in the league, so we're not like what we were in previous seasons where going all guns blazing, like we yeah. were one of the best pressing sides last season. We're a much better solid team in terms of like we can go into a mid block and condense the lines. Ruben Diaz's influence has been brilliant, as is John Stones. Mm. So I think you can manage it, but it's just when games get get headier, 
But if you're losing one nil, if you go that goal down, it's then you're going to have to expose yourself a bit, a bit more. And if you're playing against teams like your um, Everton to a point, because I think they've got some good counter-attacking players, but your Liverpool's, your Bayern's, even Spurs with Kane and Son, yeah, it, it's worrying. But I, I think we, we've done so well this year. You think we have like the fifth best defensive record in Europe, like in terms of expected goals against. You know, we've like conceded the least number of shots on target. Um, in the league per 90 so you know we've still been brilliantly defensively but they're just there's always that worry because without walker there's no one there that's particularly fast everyone just relies solely on their brilliant positioning like stones the port the the port's pretty nippy but he's more he's brilliant defensively and he can read the game as can diaz and stones is a bit nippy but he's just his positioning has been outstanding this season cancello's all right but he's a bit rash zinchenko mm -hmm. Again, he's just he, he's just a he's competent defender, but he's not fast. Walker's there as like the get out of jail free. So if any time anything goes sour, if they get in behind, we can just have a guy who's like the, the flash. He just gets back and just cuts it out, or at least gets a one on one, so the player doesn't run in on goal yeah. or runs in behind. Like I think that was an issue with the derby because Walker didn't play and he came on, and Rashford was just tearing into the space Cancelo left behind. So. I think Walker's played himself into the team pretty much. And I think he's played... Oh, he didn't play against... Oh, did he play against... No, he didn't play against Fulham. But he, I think he's now played himself into all the big games pretty much. I think he'll start this weekend. I'd be surprised if he didn't. I think he will start this weekend. But yeah, I think having him for these big games, even though he can drop a clanger in big mm. games, as he's always noted on, I think he just... You've got to have him in there because he, he provides that level of pace and that insurance that we need whenever we need to go up a gear. Mm. But at so the moment with a full squad. So you'd say he's sort of he's sort of Mr. Reliable for City, isn't he, Walker? Because he's an experienced player. He's been around the club for a while now as well, which is it's crazy. I can't even remember him playing for Tottenham now. I remember <laughs> like he was one of those players that when he when he went to City, I was like, oh it's such a strange one. It's like uh yeah, I just couldn't imagine him playing for anyone else but Tottenham and then he seems to have just uh, he seems to be the player that Pep favours, even if he's not always playing, and he, and he sometimes prefers Cancelo. Um, he is just that, like you know, he brings brings you back down to earth. He's that sometimes you need like an injection of pace in the back, or you just need it. And there's no shame in admitting that because there's you know there's flaws in every single football and system. Um, and you know, bringing Walker on for for City, I. I I'd, I'd less, I prefer less to Cancelo because, as you said there, for the way we're going to play with Richarlison and, and Calvert Lewin, and you know, with like a tight four three three, and looking to you know move, you know, Richarlison blocking the passing lanes and looking to hit his on the counter, which at times have been your weakness. Yeah, that that doesn't fill me with much faith because Kyle Walker is a good defender as well as he's good at he's good at breaking out yeah. and, and stopping. Um, you know, if, if say if the opposition team's got a corner and, and Kyle Walker's on the edge of the box and he gets the ball, you know your attack's pretty much finished because he's got the pace to get out. He's got the nous as well, hasn't he? It's not like sometimes you sign a player and they, they don't really understand the English game and they'll try and play it out when they shouldn't. Whereas Kyle Walker, he'll take that initiative and he'll he'll um, he'll just boot it if he has to. And I really admire that and really admire that in a player. He's got good gamesmanship as well. Mm -hmm. Like he knows when to wait time. He knows when to get little fouls in. But you think like Walker for a time wasn't in in the team. Like he didn't play in any of the big games during the initial run when we went on the twenty game run. Like Chelsea away, Liverpool, Liverpool away. Like the, you know one of the best. Like Mane is one of. The, I know he's not had the most brilliant season this year, but he's still an amazing player. Oh yeah. And you think he he didn't play in the Liverpool game, like our biggest game of the season, along with United. Um, at, and probably down the cup final coming up. So, you know, he, he's had to earn his way back into the side because Cancelo was playing so well and Zinchenko was really complimentary on that left-hand side. So it's cre all credit to him. But yeah, I think in this in this run now and with what United's, United's performance exposed in terms of our game plan, if we don't turn up or we just have a bad day first half of the office, first half at the office, he can provide that level of insurance and that security, as you say, because he is a really good defender. Mm. Like people, I think he gets a lot of uh, bad rep for not being a good defender. It's just because at times, especially in big games, he'll just, I think Gary Neville put it really well when we beat United in the cup, or was it a draw? I can't remember which game. But in the Derby Old Trafford, 
you can see the penalty when he ch- he just swung a foot and it hit Rashford and then we got a penalty, but he got called back for offside or something. So we got away with that one. But he just has that capability where he'll just do something in a big game. You're like, what are you doing? Just just do what you always do for 30 games of the season. You don't need to, you know, bite into a challenge or like read the game a bit too much, be too clever. And yeah. I think I think he's hopefully that doesn't happen again. That's all I can say. But I think he's he's now number one. I think Cancelo at left back will be what happens going further. I say that and he'll probably play Cancelo right back and Zinchenko left back on the weekend yeah. and then it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, and and it goes without saying that this is a big game. Um like it, it's one of the, probably the biggest in our season so far. Because we absolutely need to get to Wembley and we need to get a trophy in the cabinet, hundred percent. Like it, it's it's our goal. It's more so than a good league position for me. It's just yeah, this this is the be all and end all of Everton um is getting a trophy under Ancelotti. But um, so, you know, anything can happen. And you said there about like in the derby, with, with you know, giving away penalties or doing stupid things that in, in different games, you know, in the home league games that are, you know, pretty much nailed on. Th- those things don't happen. Big games are weird, aren't they? It tends like strange things can happen. And, uh, you know, weird score lines, weird goal scorers. That, that Tottenham game at, at Goodison is just, yeah, it's, it's exactly what I'm trying to say. Sorry. Oh, great yeah. Great I, oh. it, was it was amazing, mate. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it, it was crazy because, you know, it was just every single emotion you can feel. I I felt it. Um, yeah. And it was like, okay, we went, we went one nil down and that was like, okay, it, it's, um, it's typical Everton this. We're going to go one nil down. We're going to probably lose the game three one, four one, something like that. Um, and you know, it's just. And then obviously we got the equaliser. Bit lucky, Larry should have saved it. And then we went we went into that game and we were three one up after forty minutes, and then conceding the Lamella goal. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'm really on the edge of my seat now. And uh, Kane obviously got the equaliser, made it four four. And I didn't watch the extra time, mate. I was I was just too nervous. I thought I'm going to sit back and because I was ex- oh. no, I was I was fully expecting us to lose. Um, and I was just thinking, all right, I'm I'm not going to watch it because I know what's going to happen. Spurs are going to win this game five four. And I was like, <laughs> I'll just I'll just keep I'll just keep a sh- like a small eye on it. And um, I remember I had absolutely I'd lost completely lost track of time. And at the beginning of the, the second half of extra time, I checked and it was it was five four to us, and I was made up, and I was like, "That must be the end of the game. He must be through." Turns it on, there was still fifteen minutes left, and that that <laughs> oh, I ended up watching the majority of the, the extra time. Um, yeah, I was and honestly, mate, it was so so I was so nervous. Um, it was absolutely horrible. I felt physically sick. And uh, <laughs> it's good that we, we've got onto it because it was one of my questions. Um, and then obviously we, we go through that amazing cup tie. Uh, you know, we beat, we beat Tottenham. Bernard gets that goal and we're in the next round. And you think, okay, this is it now. If we've done that, this is our chance. And then obviously we pulled City out of, of the hat. And uh, this was before the league game as well. I remember during the, the opposition view for the league game, we spoke briefly about this game, didn't we? And um, yeah. I know on, on the live stream we did, which you can go and watch on the channel, if you want to see me live reaction to the draw, we were, none of us were really too happy, but we were sort of trying to build up a bit of positivity on the stream, being like, okay, let's just go into it. It's a one-off game, anything can happen. But what was your reaction to the draw? Were you happy getting Everton? Would you have preferred... Because I know United are still in it and City seem to fare quite well in the Cup and in like those one-off games against United. So obviously you've beaten them already once this season. So what was your reaction to the draw, really? Um, I'm not sure because like at Everton, I know we've got a, a decent record of, against them of late and obviously we beat them in the league recently. But you never want to... I know the crowd, and the crowd isn't there as well, but you never want to play Everton, just in my eyes. Because I... I for me, and I suppose it's just my sort of like again my cynicism from years back. I, I remember like going to Goodison was one of some of my first away days, and it's just horrible because it's just a horrible place to go. It's horrible. <laughs> it's like, when like just being Fellaini just push people into the like advertising boards. I was like, oh god, this is going to be an absolute nightmare of a game. 
I was there for when Rabinio scored when we won. But then there were other games away when Jelovic scored the winner. I was like, fucking hell, can't be leaving here. <laughs> yeah, I was in the yeah, I, I was at that game as well. I used to have a season <laughs> ticket in the in the family enclosure and that was probably one of the best atmospheres I'd seen at Goodison that. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah amazing day. So I always worry about that. And obviously with with Evertonians not being there, that does go in our favour to a point. But it is it's such a tight pitch, it's difficult to play. And also if you if Carlo goes again with the back three or the diamond, which I'm sure we'll get onto in, in a few bits, it, it just it just condenses the pitch and we don't have enough we don't have enough width at the moment. Like only when Phil plays, Phil Foden, we really have enough where we can stretch the pitch out wide. And it just felt like, especially in the three one, the, the pitch gets so tight and everyone's just trying to like play in these like little five yard bits and nothing's getting through. But in in terms of the draw, I would have preferred Bournemouth or Sal- Southampton naturally. It was exactly like, my exactly my reaction <laughs> when the when the draw came out. It was open for Bournemouth at home or Sheffield United or something, um, and then City exactly. came out. But um, like even Sheffield United, I would have taken. But they've been they've been really tough games we'd have in the league. Not Chelsea, not United, and I can't remember off the top of my head who the other teams are. Um, but yeah, Everton was. It was in the middle. I think it was in the middle. Like, I think there were mm. like three other teams ahead, and there were three teams below. So it was just it was in the middle. It was the team that you want you wanted to avoid them, but we didn't get United, and we didn't get we didn't get Chelsea, and I, I can't remember the other team, but like middle of the road but it's still it's not an ideal game at all and no. even though everyone wants to get easy draws we didn't get Bournemouth I don't know what's going on <laughs> they're not the the bribes aren't working we need to get the owners involved yeah well that's funny that because I remember I remember in the stream I was I was chatting to uh, Teddy on our channel and uh, we were in the stream we had like a 15-20 minute build up and we were talking about like who are we gonna get, who are we gonna get, and everyone was in the chat saying this is who we're gonna get. I hope we get these. I hope we get these. Um, and I said, what about City? What about City? And uh, and he and he just and I remember Terry vividly just go, we won't get City. They always get the easy draw. And uh, <laughs> and we pulled City out the hat, and the whole chat was just like, it's Terry's fault. Terry's completely done us over there. We've got City now at home, and. Um, I remember after the after the league game, that sort of done everyone's confidence in. And then there was like, yeah, and there's been a couple of bad results recently, like the Chelsea game. And um, yeah, it yeah, it's it's so it's so hard to predict what Everton are gonna do. I remember going into that Tottenham game with with pretty much no confidence as well, and being like, okay, something's gonna happen. <laughs> we ended up winning, so yeah, it, it it's tough. But you said then about like Goodison being tough to go tough place to go everyone seems to say that and um i just really i, I just i just want to know because from me looking i'm obviously an insider um i really just really want to know what it, what it's like because i've been to a handful of away games villa park for me is the toughest place to go um really really hard place to go uh I, i've been to a handful of away games really but um what makes it so hard? Because everyone, it seems to be a bit of a cliche. I hate going to Goodison. I hate the Everton atmosphere. What's it actually like as, as an away fan? Just the build-up to the game, really. Yeah, I think um, I touched on it a bit before, but the, in terms of the tight pitch and also, like, it, it's, it's a great ground, but it isn't like a, it isn't an enormous ground. Yeah. So like, it, you know, it's, it's still, you feel on top of it. Like, mm. I know I've seen the, the away fans are like right at the bottom in the corner and you're just surrounded like you've got the massive stand to your left and then you've got all the fans I remember I can't remember which one it was definitely a loss but I remember there was like two bits and then it was the away fans and you just it becomes like a lion pit when it's when it gets going but I think that is always predicated on from what I've noticed from the you think I've I think I went three times maybe four like mm. it was all my early away days that I went to yeah um but it's, it's always on, typically, on a massive challenge at the start. And it's always someone getting battered. It's always like yeah. someone, Seamus Coleman's going to do a sliding tackle out of nowhere just to get someone going. And I think that's when the... I think it's more when the crowd gets going. But every time I've been, it's always there. So I can't say if it's a regular thing, but I'd imagine it is. But I think for City, I think it's... There is a bit of a... Not a huge rivalry, but there's, there's that because there's quite a lot of commonalities between the two clubs. Mm. It is still a big game for both teams. We're not, we always 
you had a hoodoo over us for ages, especially while Moyes was there. You never beat them a lot, but you always kept beating us. Like, it's like, like you need to beat United. Like, let us get the points. That's what we need. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just a tough place to go. It's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a really like the pitch is so short, and you got the um, wooden seats as well. <laughs> the fans, are, the fans are just literally like like two yards away. There's no yeah. like distance. Yeah, actually, like the ball goes out, and you're just gonna get absolute abuse hurled at you as a as a player or whatever. You just got to not like block it out. Yeah, it, nice. it's uh yeah, it. I don't know it. I, I don't know if it's ever really struck me as an insider as a tough place for an away fan to to come, because I obviously get the fact that you you sort of tucked away in the corner, aren't you, in the Bullens Road end, um, and it's like it, it's but as as a home fan, I've always thought like, is it actually that hard for for like City fans or any fans really to come to come to Goodison? Because like, um, I always walk past the past the away fans be, before. Going to going to where I where I go into the ground because I used to sit uh, in in the actual Bullens Road end. I used to be able to look at the away fans, um, yeah. And I remember going past, and every single time I seemed to be going past, the away fans seemed really really up for it, more so than like any game I'd watch on telly. Like it, it seemed like there was always the away fans were always up for it, and there was always a massive presence with City as well. Because I know there's been a couple of big, big clashes with City in recent years as well, with them going for the title and City. It's always been a massive game recently. And um, it's like, it. I think that has had, that had an impact and it's been, it always seems to come across and it's a massive game. Less so this year, but this one, this weekend, I know if there was fans there, it would have been, it would have been oh, absolutely yeah. giant. Like, uh, yeah. Because uh, of the club as well, because your, cause your yeah. circumstances, because your, you're thankfully now on the up and up. So, you know, it's a, as, as you said, like winning a trophy is like a huge part of like the the Ancelotti project. I have to use that word twice. I apologize, mm. but like it's the best word to describe it. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it like, it, it's such a huge step for Everton. And, you know, I think, you know, if the fans were there, it would have been, it'd be a horrible, horrible game. It would be horrible. Because yeah. I think it would be, it also affects from, because I can't remember in the last game, there was, it wasn't, I think that's, I think it's sort of the thing that's happened throughout the, the no crowds, but it's very sanitised, I think. I know Everton put in a few big challenges every now and then because you've got players that are quite physical, like with Yerry Mina and Colden and that, and um, and Corey as well. But there's, it didn't feel like that in the last game. There wasn't, it was much more tactical, it was much more like yeah. positioning. There was no one flying into challenges, but if the crowd's there, it just gives you that extra percent. And I think also going back to your point about well, fans are sort of like, really up for it whether it's because I think I think what on one level it's a respect for Everton but I think because it's such a old ground such a respected ground it's got that proper away day feel it isn't mm. like and obviously like talking about crowd like crowd atmospheres to a city fan you can only imagine what your comment section is going to be like but like you know <laughs> it, it's just got that that feel to it like you you, you really like you know you, you walk outside the ground and then there's just houses it's just like it's like a yeah. proper it's like hybrid it's like you go into a real like established old school ground and you know and also there's just loads of pubs in Liverpool so you just get absolutely wrecked so. yeah I, I was gonna ask you because I'm really keen to know what it's like for someone who's been to Goodison as an away fan multiple times um what is there any like specific memories you have of Goodison that I could be like oh yeah that's that that's just a typical thing that we always see is there anything that like sort of catches you off guard in you know in terms of how different it is to the Etihad because I can imagine it being quite similar to Main Road um, but you know, is is there anything that really strikes you as well, this is different, or this is like okay, they, this is always the the cliche Everton away sort of thing? Because I know there's like uh, I know there's been people like watching it on telly recently who's like put, purposely put like things in front of the tellies to to mimic the posts because you never seem to get a decent view of the game at Goodison. <laughs> The view yeah. is bad, yeah. <laughs> but is is there anything that you sort of like always walk past, or anything that you can remember from your trips to Goodison that's like, okay, this is Everton. I'm not sure about specific things in terms of like. I think the most startling thing is just when you walk out and you just you straight away into a street and it's like, oh yeah, say, yeah. It, it, it is old school. And like obviously with City, like I can only remember bits and pieces of Main Road because I was incredibly young, like, and then obviously moved to Eastlands. Mm. You know, I was only about six, 
six or seven at the time when that happened. Um, at, but obviously with the Etihad, it's built on a massive complex and obviously they've, they've improved it year on year. So it's like a massive industrial estate now. It's, you don't get that type of feel like you are just like in the, yeah. you, I'd say you're in the lion's den. Like even if it, you can't be going out there like giving it the big end because if you're going to go out, there's going to be loads of Americans waiting for it. Yeah. I remember one when, uh, when we did the when we did beat you with the Rubinho goal, was that in 2008, 2009? Or something. something like that, yeah. Um, and my, because we had to, because we, one of my dad's closest friends is an Evertonian. Mm. Um, and we had to wait for him. So obviously all the City fans had got, and we were just waiting. And then all the Evertonians started coming out. And we were waiting. And my dad got up at like the, um, there's like a bit outside the UA bit, like once you come out of the ground, and there's like a little like, like I don't know if it's like a fence or something, but somewhere where you can stand. And he stood up and started singing Blue Moon. And there's like just thousands of Evertonians. Like, and I had to like pull him down. I was only like, I can't remember how old I was at the time. But I think yeah. it might be like 14 or something. And I was like, what the hell are you? We're going to get absolutely bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> so many more his mates started doing it. But like, that's one of the memories that always sticks out to me because I think it was the first time we beat Everton in years. Like, yeah. after the like, I've never think- done well then. I think I was at that game actually because that was my first season that I started going the game because I was I was seven at the time, um, going into that season and I remember we fin- we finished fifth and we played quite well in the odd game and we got to the cup final as well and that was my first season and I think I remember that game. I think you wore the red and black sort of striped yeah. away kit. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I remember it now. But that's always been my fondest season. I can imagine that because you come out, don't you? You come out of the away end and you're straight on Bullens Road and there's the little Bullens Road ticket office and the school's yeah, there yeah. as well. The school's there and the there's just houses right in front of it. And you're looking yeah. into people's bedroom windows, aren't you? Like, <laughs> as soon as you come out, they're like, that must be so strange for an away fan to come out because... Yeah, you yeah. come Like, you're used to coming out of these new grounds. I remember coming out to Liberty Stadium a few seasons ago in Swansea and it was like chip fans and and like <laughs> big massive open spaces and I was like yeah. this this feels so so foreign to me but um yeah sorry to throw it off guard with that question but it just really interested me because I I, I speak to a lot of away fans nowadays but I, I rarely speak to them about what it's like actually coming to Goodison and, and how it feels um but moving on to us you mentioned Ancelotti but we've lost our last two games it's been a real, real slog. Um, have you watched us recently? And where do you think the problems lie? Where do, you, where do you think the problem is for us? Because I know we've got injuries, but um, it feels a lot like there's maybe not, maybe not fight missing, but there is definitely quality missing. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I've not. I've only watched the highlights from match today. I always try and keep yeah. tabs on everything, but it's just like. It, it's almost like football overload at the moment. So I think. So oh yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely. Watching City is just like enough, and like I'll, I'll just watch the highlights to catch up, and I'll look at some of the stats and stuff. Um, so mm. unfortunately, I've not watched any of the games like through and through, but just from an initial like looks, I, I did some bits like just looking at what was where players have done well for Everton this year in terms of the stats, and then I read a Greg O'Keefe's article that got released yeah. this morning about Everton the. Uh, with Hamez's injury, which is great to see that he's out. Like, uh, yeah. No, <laughs> no, like, no I, I understand that. I think, um, I think I was going to rebuttal this and come back to you on it because, like, I think what I'd say from just as I'm looking in is the issue is Hamez is such a particular player. Like, he's an extraordinary player. And the fact you've got him is just amazing. Mm. Um, but there's Naturally, there's not a lot of players that have this type of skill set in your team. No, there is. You've got a lot of you've got a lot of tidy players on the ball. I know like Allen and Decore are great players, and um, and Charleston and Calvin Lewin and Dinho uh, and Luca Dean. Sorry, but it seems like going forward, it's like Decore, Allen, Gomez, Bernard, Davis. They're all nice nip and tuck players. They're like you know the the, the to tidy on the ball, but they're not like they're not going to play killer passes or oh. they're not going to be that great of engine. And I think you've, and then on the flip side, you've got players like Richarlison, um, Dominic Calvert Lewin, Iwobi, who are really good in open space, who can yeah. attack really well uh, on the counter and create chances, like into, or, or be on the end of chances. But you don't really have anyone who can play like those inside balls. I think 
And I, I'm assuming that's what happened in the Burnley game. Like you, the, apparently, Gregor Coop said the diving yeah. tried didn't work at all, and just breaking uh, breaking those stubborn teams down. And I think that comes with comes with recruitment, but it comes with time and uh, team progressing with itself and getting those key players because getting those like David Silvers or those Luka Modric's, and obviously you have Hammers, but he's getting he's going to try and get another player like that, someone who can who can do well in the press because I think. Hamez still struggles. He doesn't really do that much running off the ball. He just sort of just waits to get the ball. And he'll he'll do his business. Mm-hmm. But I think that's where the struggle is. It's that player who can just unlock something out of nowhere, can play those inside balls. Because I, I was looking at the stats here, and like I think he's like Hamez is by far your best creative player. Funny enough, iwobi has got some really good stats, and I always feel like Iwobi gets a bit of a bad rep a lot yeah. of the time. We actually did a video on our on our channel the other day just talking about him, about Awobi and where his where his future lies really, because he's getting such a he's getting a, a real bad rap and he's that he did like an he did an Instagram post after the Chelsea game, sort of slating Ancelotti and how he wanted to play in his normal position, which was behind the two yeah. strikers. Yeah. And um he basically yeah it was it was basically he being called up to Nigeria's national team. And he was like, it was straight after the game, it was a few hours, I think. And he was like, made up to get called up for Nigeria. Finally might get to play in my preferred position. And so basically all Evertonians took that as why are you having a go for? Um and then he played. Ancelotti said, put your money where your mouth is then and played him in that exact position against Burnley. Yeah, and, on the team, yeah. Yeah, and although he played all right, he didn't like set the world on fire. And that sort yeah. of brought him back down to earth and people are going, is he like do you know what I mean? It's like Yeah. It, it I've never seen like a number ten though. That's no, me, neither did I. Really, neither did he's I. He's a really good dribbler and he's a he, he's a very aggressive player and I think he can maybe get you in behind, but he never felt like some creative hub like like Hammers. He's never really had that sort of really proficient technical ability. You know, he's he's seen he's got this quite weird sort of style like unorthodox it's very similar to like a sterling like he's the way he moves the ball the way he moves his body like he doesn't he doesn't shift it like like you'd normally see with a dribbler or see with a creative player so i find it strange he wants to play number 10 and obviously you've got sigurdsson who can do that but he seems like he's sort of a whining year on year it doesn't seem like he's anywhere near the player he was no i suppose he can do a job and i think that's i think in the squad, I think that's what the issue is. I think it just I could be completely off the mark, but it just feels like that that type of player, I think Gregor Keith was trying to touch on it, that Hamez naturally is just so gifted. And I think you need another player who can unlock something, who, yeah. can, who can be like your your, heart, your creative heartbeat. That's the... all, everyone, yeah. Go on. No, just because I think Luca Dean's a really, really good player and he's very, very creative. But again, he... His creation comes from out wide. He doesn't really drift in with like a Cancelo or anything like that. He's just brilliant on the overlap and getting balls into the box. And you've got really good height and you've got good players in the air, like with uh, Dominic Carver Lewin, with Charleston, pretty good in the air. And, you know, he might get someone like DeCorey running late. But everyone else is just, I think you've got a lot of tidy players, as I say, but no no one with that cutting edge. I think that's what sets Everton apart from teams above them that yeah. might get top four. Because I think that you need a couple of you can't just rely on the one player because if you get injured like as they have done now, you your team can sort of like you rely solely on the few chances you'll create just naturally because of quality mm-hmm. or from a set piece rather than like having the ball a lot, which I think Everton are gonna try try and do with Ancelotti, try and become that progressive team. You need more players to chip in and really create. And I'm I'm not sure you have enough of them in your squad. We definitely don't. That's what I wanted to touch on when you were mentioning Walker. And it completely went out of my head. But that's the difference, is that if Cancelo's having a bad game, City just bring Kyle Walker on. Um, mm-hmm. I remember in the league game against us, I think it was 1-1 and he's brought on Kevin De Bruyne. And it was like, <laughs> yeah. and it was like yeah. that's the difference. And it was blatantly obvious in the game against Chelsea, we just didn't have enough quality. Like, Well, you mentioned... To be fair, you have mentioned the, te- the two teams with the best squads in the league. Yeah. To be fair, you know, I, I get what you're saying, though. Like, the squad that... And I'll, this is, as I say, I say, I try and mention it as much as possible because it feels like the BBC and every man and his dog who's commentating always brings up how much our bench costs at the moment, which is really frustrating. But it's like, it's the first time we've had everyone fit at the exact same... Like, everyone is fit. There's no one injured, which is yeah. so strange. And obviously, 
we have obviously miles more resources than Everton actually, and but Everton do have a lot of money, which is good. But this is this has been a long time thing. You think we're five years into Guardiola, and Guardiola's yeah. got had a lot of money to spend. Ancelotti's, you think, what well, it's only a couple of years. It's still early doors. Like you, obviously, you need this is still a big season. But there's there's still time to get those players, and you've shown in the summer that you, you've bought really well, and it's just doing that again. But I think it's again getting those key attacking areas because I think defensively you've looked pretty all right this year. Like, yeah, no, definitely. Because like so. The, the, this, and you've tied Luca Dean down to a big contract. Mm. You know, if, you know the, the the signs there of progression. So that's a great thing to see. But the difference for us in Chelsea is we've had the big money to spend and to get the get that squad built up as much as possible. But yeah, I think that's what sets it apart in, in the long run because in that game bringing on Kevin De Bruyne, like, it's just that it's just it's not fair. Like in that's midweek, a, that's the level above. That's it. Yeah, in midweek we. Um, he did, we made five changes, um, Guardiola, and all the five players, I, I will come on to it in a second, like, I suspect will start this weekend. But he brought on, like, Fernandinho, Aguero, Laporte. Yeah. Like, just yeah. incredible, incredible depth that we have. Uh, and that's what he's, that, that's what we're going to need to go far in these tournaments because there's no other way. You couldn't... What, like, you think Liverpool... Just as as a as an uh, arbitrary example, you did th- their squad rotation is very limited. Like I know they still used they still got a decent squad and they and they rotated a bit, but they relied. He- you could predict their starting eleven. Yeah, every no, for about 100%. two and a half years. And they they went far in two competitions. You know, they threw away both both of the domestics, and you think that that's brought them to the bone this season. It's come to the fore now, and like. For us, the only way we can compete in all these games, playing 60 games a season, where we've, you know, hardly had any pre-season, for, for example, this year, it's just, you need 20, 20 odd players to be fit, because there's no way you could yeah. do it playing the same 11 or with 14 players. And, you know, when we played against Chelsea, we only had like 14 squad players available. But since then, we've slowly got everyone back. And that's how we've been able to keep this run going. I know we lost recently, but you know, three wins on the bounce again, you know, into the Champions League quarters, got this quarter final, the League Cup final, and the league, we've got a really good, healthy distance from United and Leicester. You know, it, it can only be done with the genius of Guardiola and the brilliance of the players, but the, the, the plethora of talent is needed because otherwise you would just sink away. We see it with Leicester all the time. Yeah. Leicester's constantly faded away because. They get, they've been unfortunate with injuries, but that depth isn't there. They've got a good squad, but there's just a few of those players go missing and it just starts coming off a little bit and then you lose yeah. that confidence you had earlier on in the season. Well, that's that's the thing, is that, that the days are gone, really. When If you say to somebody now, what's your favourite team of all time? They're not going to tell you, oh, I think Man City 17-18 was the best team ever because... They can't, you can't predict the start 11 anymore. They'd rather give you individual players and go, okay, this is my favorite goalkeeper, this is my favorite left back, this is my favorite two center backs. The days yeah. are gone. The days are gone where you go, okay, you can say that's that Sentinels City team was fantastic, or you go, Chelsea 0405 was brilliant, or Arsenal Invincibles. But as soon as that sort of finished, you stop being able to predict 11, a, a team of 11 every week, and that Liverpool team. 17, 18, 18, 19. That was the first time in ages where you go, okay, I know who's going to start in goal. I know the back four. I know the three in midfield and I know the three up front. And you know the team off the back of your hand. But you can't do that anymore. You can't play no. 60 games with 11 players. It's impossible. It's physically impossible. And um, like that's that's what, that's what wound me up about Liverpool this season. I've just moaned about Jordan Pickford being the, being the problem for their injuries because they've missed Van Dijk. And... And I, it's sort of, it's sort of, and it, my, my rebuttal is always, okay, but what about City? You know, we're missing players. City are missing players. We've missed, we've we've had some of the worst injuries in the league and a lot of people would say we're outperforming ourselves. Um, So I don't think, in, I don't think you can really complain about injuries anymore because the best teams have got the squad depth. That's it. Yeah. Simple as. And the best teams are able, seem to be able to keep their players fit for a long amount of time. Um, but I, I agree with you in, in that sense, Rob, is that we've got a handful of players that I'd say, these are the players that 
other teams will want that are Champions League players. I'd say uh, Luca Dean is one of the best in his position in Europe. James Rodriguez, Richarlison, and I think Calvert Lewin can be a great striker in, in a couple of years' time once he, you know, he, he fixes on his finishing a little bit because although he scored a lot of goals, he does need to fix it a bit. But I'd say they're they're the crop of players who I'd go. All okay, right, then those three are going on. If they're not already fantastic players, they can be. Um, and I think the problem with football fans nowadays, with like the rise of social media and everything's on Twitter or something like that, is football fans are very fickle, and they only see what's in front of them. And it's hard. It's easy to remember Rob Carlo Ancelotti's in his first full season still. He's only he only I took. Think it was, I don't know how long he'd been here. Yeah, yeah. He, he took over at the took over at the tail end of last year, so he he came in. I think his first game was Boxing Day last season, and he managed us for three months until lockdown and the fans left. He's only managed like five or six games at Goodison with fans in the ground, um, so it's it's crazy to think this fantastic world beaten manager who is a, still a fantastic manager in my eyes, if not the best in the league, one of them, because uh, I think Pep touched on it and he touched on it with Chris Wilder as well. He said, um, Chris Wilder could do what I've done with this City team, but I couldn't do what he's done with that Sheffield United team. And the fact that Carlos came in and he's he's gotten us playing so well, he's got us defending well as well, which you said. He's got us defending like an Italian team, an old Italian team for the first time in years. And that's been the problem under Silva and Koeman. We weren't able to defend. We were absolutely awful at defending. And we had players like Cujo Martina in defence and or John Joe Kenny was filling in at left back and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? What a player. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mate. What, a, what a legend. Um, but no, that's a really good point. Like Michael Keane's having a revelatory season like, and I, I've yeah. never rated him at all but looking at his stats and watching a few of his um, few of the highlights and just seeing the, the overall chat online from Everton fans it seems like Michael Keane's like done brilliant right. he's a year. different player he's a, it's, it's strange like I want to know what, what what someone's done with the real <laughs> Michael Keane because he's a different player I swear to God mate I don't know what it is I don't know if it's having younger players around him and giving him more of a a captain mentality or yeah. if it's just the manager likes him but he's just he, he looks unbeatable at times and he pitches up with a few goals and like yeah. he's he's at the point now where um if you compare him to John Stones who's had a fantastic season for City he's better than what John Stones was in his final season with us and he was a brilliant player for us in his final season Stones he had 15 16 and then he, he went to City because He's better at passing the ball. He's he looks fearless as well. That game at that game at Anfield, which we were all, you know what I mean. We were all we were all nervous for that one. He was he just looked like a titan, like he wouldn't yeah. be beaten. No one was getting round him. And Ben Godfrey next to him has been fantastic. Mason Holgate's yeah. been a bit up and down, and then Luca Dean's been. He Luca Dean just proven why he's why he's such a great player. But um, there's so I think. People need to look at it as okay. We've gone in, and as well, Decore is injured for this weekend as well. I didn't even know if you knew, but no, I did. I checked. So I, was, I was like, thank God. Yeah, because <laughs> and that that's where that's where our problems are going to lie this weekend. But um, that's for another video. He's he's a he's yeah he's he's what he's, I'd say. Sorry, is he out for the season? Is it eight to ten oh. weeks? He's broke his he's broke his foot. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's horrible. But I'd argue he's been our best player this season, Decore. Like he just yeah. he, he's played he played every minute up until he got injured, except for one game, I think, where he was suspended. Um he's been fantastic. You know, well, Keane's... That... Go on. Sorry. No, no, sorry. I'll stay it's... After. But it's like uh you know, Carlo went out. He spent sixty million on Hammers Rodriguez, Alan, Decore, and Ben Godfrey. And you know, Sam Allardyce spent sixty million on Walcott and Cheng Tosin. So it's like the the change is there. It's obvious to see. For the first time ever, we've got a world class manager, a fantastic director of football. We're winning games that we shouldn't be winning. Yeah, we've lost a few. But we're we're actually in the hunt for Europe. 
And that, that you know what I mean? For for his first full season with the squad he's got, with absolutely zero squad depth, I might add. Yeah. The amount of times this season where we've had two goalkeepers on the bench is just been... <laughs> um, it's usually two goalkeepers, Broadhead, Onyango, just youth academy players, and then it'll be King and Bernard. That, that's been our team this season. Because the majority of the time, our players are injured. But um, it's been fantastic to see us see him and it makes me think like you imagine in a few seasons time if we keep adding them if we keep adding four players of that quality every season yeah, and exactly. we end up having that de- we end up having a world beaten starting 11 and the team the players we have now drop to the bench we're going to be at least fighting for the top four every season well that's the plan isn't it yeah that, that is the plan and i think we touched upon it earlier like that i that recruitment is is insane. It is insane. And, you know, if you keep, keep you can add to that in key areas, you know, uh, that's, I'd say we've touched upon number 10, if we, I'd say probably a couple more wingers, hmm. um, maybe probably a right back and maybe another centre half. Yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly what we want, really. You'd probably say goalkeeper as well, but like, you know, that, I think that's either here or there at the moment. But yeah. It's the, the, there's the foundations there, and the fact you've got Carlo Ancelotti, that is just insane. And you've got the you've got the the plan to move to the new ground uh, whenever that happens. Mm-hmm. But the, the, going in the right direction. But as you say, with social media, it's just it's immediacy everywhere. There's no level of patience anymore, and I think fans have to the, the, like not the online fans, but the fans really of the clubs that, that go to the games. It's it's maintaining that level of patience. It's just you know knowing that the club are making the right decisions and Everton are showing that they are making a lot of the right decisions, but they just, they just got to keep chugging away because it's not going to be an overnight thing. As City wasn't an overnight thing. No, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to 16, 17 and we beat you 4-0 at Goodison that year. And it was like, there was some players in that side, like I'm, I'm trying to think up a couple, I think Mangala was still playing for you. Um, well, that's when Frodiola started. It was that game because I remember because I was at uni. And um, Fraudiola, that was when it all... Yeah. I'm sure it probably came up before, but that was when it really... I remembered that game because we were so abject that game. And you and you only have four shots on target, but you, you just look more devastating than us. We could, I know we should have had a penalty because Sterling got... He was a good... The keeper was Rob Bless or something. It, it yeah. Was he. It was yeah. He. <laughs> he challenged Sterling. It should have been a penalty, but the fact is, we, you know, we four shots and, like, crap, we had a hologram in there. You couldn't say the thing. And yeah, the team the team's taken evolution just with Guardiola. But I was just saying in terms of the whole since the takeover, you think of like what I'm saying with the kid, this kid, um, the kid that was inspired from this one in 2009. Um, you think you know, Adebayor, Rocky Santa Cruz, as you said before yeah. we started recording. You know, you know Wayne Bridge. You had to we had to build you had to build the B team before you get the A team. You, you know, you can't just buy Champions League quality. But the thing is, yeah. with Everton. You have a level of a shortcut there because you you have Ancelotti you have Ancelotti you have one of the best managers in Europe already so and you're challenging for top four you're able to get Hamas Rodriguez even at a cost with the idea of his injuries um, and he's not the, the best pressure in the world like for, just for one example of his mm. his deficiencies I suppose but you've got that player you've got Hamas Rodriguez in the side you've got a player from Real Madrid in the team and he's made a huge effect and you've got players like Allen and we. Just circling back to Decore, I always, I always thought that was an amazing pickup. I thought he could have gone to like United or something, or gone to yeah. Liverpool. I thought that, that was the level, like because he showed with, with him and Capu, two really good holding midfielders, and Capu's gone to Villarreal now and doing really well. But I remember that first game when you beat Spurs, where Spurs were absolutely appalling, mm. and everyone was talking about Allen. Everyone was like, he's on, unbe- and I was like, did you watch Decore? He's like just kept running. It was like, yeah. what he had before the game. And yeah. that's what he brings that he brings that energy and that velocity to the team. And that's what I hope is what Everton will miss this weekend because while Davis has actually seems to have quite a bit of an upturn in form recently, Gomez is all right. Gomez is I think it's just a much more much leaves a lot to be game. desired, Andre Gomez. And Alan's brilliant, but he's more he's just that stalwart. Works better with better players around him. Yeah, I think with speed around him. I think he he, he you see it when he was at Napoli. He had speed around him, even in midfield, that could move the ball off him and give yeah. him runners and, and could do the running for him. You don't want Alan getting drawn out all the time. Because no, he's, no. he's got Thiago run ability where he'll just bite into a challenge. He's got that sort of tenacity. And he'll just and he could get the books really early. 
And I think that you just want him, just get him on the ball and get him dictating the, the t- tempo of the game. And then also just telling the team where to move where, because he's got that experience. But don't let him start like crunching into challenges because you need everyone around him just to do the running for him. And I think yeah. that's where I'm hoping that without the core, because he complements him so well, that's where you might struggle this weekend with us. Because we're going to, we don't have a lot of speed in midfield, but we, speed of thought is absolutely insane. Like I, it, It's difficult saying because watching City every week, you become conditioned that this is how football is. And it really isn't like that. And I know sometimes we say about, uh, not not we, but like online fans can say City play boring football, but it's just the, the, the ability we have to maintain possession, but also to move the ball as quickly as we have done during Guardiola and, and this season as well. Just like, it's remarkable. And while like good players like Bernardo and Rodri and Gundogan aren't quicker than a Richarlison, aren't quicker than Decore probably, but they just move the ball so yeah. quickly with the full touch and they just, we can just build it around a team. And I'm hoping that's where if, unless he goes with the back three and just and Ancelotti just packs the midfield like he did last game, then it'll all then come down to the, width, the wide players. But just that ability to, just to move the ball quickly. Does that, is in, does that with, with sorry to interrupt you there, mate, but like with those um, players, you know, I said before about Richarlison, Rodriguez, and Dean, I said there's the potential for them to be world class players. Richarlison is a fantastic player. But he's still really, I think he's only 23, 24. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's crazy to think. But then you look at a Bernardo Silva who hasn't got all the pace in the world, but these players seem to have an extra 10 seconds on the ball, seem to yeah. always be in space, seem to be able to play the killer pass. And I think with a couple more seasons of constant recruitment, you know, a couple of wingers, a new right back, hopefully Max Adams, because he's the one we've been linked with since the beginning of the season. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, would be a really good signing, especially with Godfrey there next to him. Um, yeah, and so it it be massive for us to just keep going the way we're going, be patient about it because um, if we just keep and and the problem is Robbie said there about how Guardiola taken up, but City have been. City be City have been take, got taken over. What is it? 11, 12 years ago now. Um, since since yeah, so since awesome. since Mansour mm-hmm. took over. So, and people say, okay, everything takes time. And I remember City really started to show they were they were good after about five or six years, didn't they? 2011, 12, 2012, 13. That was when City started to become the monster that that we know them to be nowadays. Um, but, yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, you know, that was when the first league title come and you're never going to shake your head to the league title, so... No, no, but I just bent into... I get what you're saying, like, winning the league title, the way it was it was crazy, given the context of it and the first first one in 44 years and, and also the manner of which we won it from eight points behind, yeah. I, in terms of the, the monster element, that's what, just to sort of digress a bit, that's what people are forgetting with what Guardiola's brought here, and this hmm. is... We all talk about the Champions League, and that's what's peddled at Guardiola. Like the only manager to win it twice and get constantly criticised for only doing that. Like winning the Champions League is huge for the club for so many different reasons. But what he had to install, like what he had to do at Bayern, which everyone sort of skirts over as well, is establish that level of dominance. We weren't, we were up there with Pellegrini and Mancini. Like we were second the year after we uh, we won it, but we we were way off him. Like United just walked it. And then we came back and won it again. And then the two years after, we became second uh, when Mourinho came back for Chelsea. But we were way off it that year. And then we came fourth the year after, uh, the mm. year before um, Pellegr- uh, Guardiola came in. But what Guardiola's brought in is that monster. He's brought in that we are, we are that it's, it's a, d- a different level now compared to, and plus it's the consistency of performance and the consistency of brilliance. And obviously that comes down to accruing a crap sort of great players as well don't get me wrong but he's made a lot of players who were really good before miles better like we knew De Bruyne was going to be a really good buy when we got him I know everyone, you, you got great videos of Paul Merson saying he thought he was Lear and stuff but when he came in he looked talented but now he's arguably one of the best players the Premier League seen or at least one of the best players in the past 10-15 years yeah but that was and, that, and it's 
that monster's there now. But I'll be a bit pedantic. I apologise, but like I'm just saying that like, that monster has only has come later down the line mm. because it was it was very much up and down. It was never getting that level of consistency to properly challenge for a title. Mm. And what Guardiola's brought in is, you think we challenged for a title. I know we didn't challenge last year, but you think Liverpool that was an exceptional team. That was an exceptional season. 99 points isn't normal to get. We got 81. That's a really good total for, for all the crap that was going on for, throughout that season. To get 81 points and win a trophy. Just to always be there, as he says, you know, you've got to be there. To always be there in, in a final or to, you know, just get that winning mentality. That it, it's just it's a no and he's brought that. He's definitely brought that to the club. Yeah. Well, I think. And like people say, oh, everything takes time, everything takes time. We got taken over, I think it was February 2016, which is five years ago now. And people go, well, why haven't we seen any results? We've had, we've had, because Everton were in, Everton and City were in the same pool in the early 2000s. Like, I remember City were like Stuart Pearson and stuff like that when you first, first moved to Eastlands. And City was just sort of bobbing around mid table. Happy to sit there, happy to make sure they were in the league every season. Um, and then got taken over and immediately started to show a bit more ambition. Uh, it was like there was like the Mancini years, there was the Pellegrini years and stuff like that. Since uh, Everton were, were that, happy to stay in the league, happy to bob round mid table under Moyes. Martinez came in and overperformed for this first season, then we just fell off completely. And then it, we got taken over. Since we've got taken over, Farhad Mashiri, our, our, our Sheikh Mansour, if you like, he has put faith in every single manager. He gave millions to Ronald Koeman. He gave millions to Marco Silva. And he even gave millions to Sam Allardyce for six months. So it's only now we finally got all that rubbish out of, out of, the, out, you know, out of our system. We finally got a world-class manager who can do magic with... No squad at all. We've got a, a director of football in Marcel Brands who has made a couple of bad buys in his time at Everton, but that's only been because they've come from the manager. So he, but he seems to be able to go out and get a player, which is good because you know if if Everton are linked with a player more often than not nowadays we get him. Um, finally now after a year under Ancelotti, we're seeing a little bit of progression in the way that. We've got the money there. We've got a good director of football who's going to go out and get the players he wants. He's made four fantastic signings who have been our four of our best players this season. There's finally a little bit of a little bit of progression, but because it's been five years coming and we've watched really, really rubbish football up until now, people are people are impatient, and that's been the problem for Everton um, recently. Is that we've just I don't even think we're setting our aspirations too high. We just, finally, we've got someone who knows what they're doing. But that being said, we spoke a lot about squad depth. Rob, what's your City lineup for Saturday? Uh, oh, God, it's so difficult to predict a Pep lineup, honestly. Oh, it's, it's the same with Ancelotti. Like, it's, it's yeah. You know, the one thing under him is that you never know what his lineup's going to be. But I suppose a preferred lineup, what would you like to see, really? Okay, preferred lineup. That, yeah. That's probably a bit easier. But um, mm-hmm. just just before you go, like I think you're being a bit harsh on Moyes. There, Moyes did pretty well for you. Like he got you. No, no. Obviously, as us with Pierce, like you weren't not no. going at home for like six months. <laughs> well, yeah, no, but it's like I know we had no money and he kept us there, but there was no ambition. We were never going to win anything. There was never any like, all right, look out for Everton, guys. There was probably United had come to us once a year and we beat them at Goodison or. You know, maybe we we win a game against Chelsea or something like that. But like, we were bobbing round with Z, with no money at all. I remember I remember we went two years without making a sign, and at one point I think it was. Um, remember we signed Johnny Eitinger, and for about eighteen months we didn't spend money on a player. And when we did, <laughs> yeah, and when and when we did spend money on a player, I think it was Jan Mucker, and it was about six hundred thousand pound, which just shows you. Everton was scraping the bottom of the bargain bin back then. Um, yeah, Muck, he? Oh, he was. He, uh, he, he was in. <laughs> he, he was in goal that game. Yelovich scored. At oh, was it? Yeah, what yeah, 
Yeah, Tim Howard got an injury and he came into the side for like three or four games and absolutely played out of his skin. And it was the only four appearances he'd ever made. He, he was bald. He looked a bit like Voldemort. Looks a bit like Lord Voldemort. <laughs> yeah, Google him. Jan Mucha, he was Slovakian, I think. But yeah, he plays in that game um, where we beat his 2 0 at Goodison. But yeah. All right. But um, yeah, nah, I think. Um, nah, but it, it goes back to the point we were saying earlier uh, and, and the old cliche that everyone just thinks the money can buy something. And money's so important, but you've got to buy the right players. You have to. Oh, yeah, you definitely. Because really, you can get players on bad contracts like we did at the start of when we got bought. The only reason the players were coming at the start for us was because we were going to offer them loads of money. And then you've got by by the time you've built, you've got that Europa League team and then you've got into the Champions League. Then you've got like your Wayne Bridges on absolute crap tons of money that are never going to start because they're not good enough. Like they, they, they were there to get you to, to, into Europe. But then when you want to get to the Champions League and you want to make a difference, though you can't shift those players to them. No. Re- re- replace those players. So it's all about recruitment and Everton has shown that they the, the, the recruitment is going in the right direction. So that's been that. our that's been our problem last yeah, year yeah, or so. With like Walcott and all oh, the players it's on like, free contract. When you were getting like Davy Clarkson in, it's yeah, like, what's good we can't we couldn't give we literally could not give Sandro Ramirez away. <laughs> the man, <laughs> no one wanted him. So yeah. we right, we couldn't give Sandro Ramirez away. No one would take him. Cenk Tosin has finally gone out on loan to Besiktas and hopefully we'll get rid of him. Um, Yannick Balassi has finally left the club. Um, is he like, uh, he's like Sheffield Wednesday or like Birmingham? He's at Middlesbrough. He's at Middlesbrough now. Middlesbrough? Yeah. <laughs> and, Neil Warner. Yeah, oh, mate, it's him. like looking through your Facebook memories from years ago <laughs> and being really embarrassed. It's, it's so, it's honestly, it's so, the, the absolute rubbish we've signed, like, like, and yeah, it's there's been so much rubbish since we got taken over. It feels like you've gone in the shop and just bought stuff you don't need. Um, <laughs> we but finally we've got there's a bit of direction. People have got to be patient now because we need to stop turning on managers when things aren't going as we plan. But we've got the best, ma- we've got one of the best managers in the league now. No one can argue with that. Um, exactly. So no, we've no, just, no. just got to pers- pers- persevere with it. Completely agree, yeah. But what do you think your team will be? Just before I say my preferred team, because I think how you how you could potentially set up, I think would then may sort of guide me into how Pep might approach it. Because obviously, mm. me and Pep are alive. We we're very similar in terms of our like knowledge of the game. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> well, just me, me and Carlo Ancelotti are very similar in our knowledge of the game <laughs> as well. Well, do you think it'll be a back four or like a back three? Or do you think he'll, do you think he'll do the diamond again? Because from Greg O'Keefe said that the diamond was terrible against Burnley, and it then was. obviously we played completely different to Burnley. But is there an? What do you think he might play? Like who? Who the main players that will probably play? I'd hate for it to be. I don't want to be to be the diamonds again because that's suicide going into the game. I think after he, Burnley managed to tear it apart. So, and not that Burnley aren't a great team, but when you're coming up against City, it's a different animal. Um, Burnley played really well. But I'd, I'd like to see us go with the back three, with the two wing-backs again, um, if, if, every, if you know, the players are fit and available. I'd like to see it with, um, you know, like the back three and Michael Keane, if Yeri Mean is fit as well. Hopefully Yeri Mean is fit. He's on the bench against Burnley, because I checked, because mm. I... That was one of those players I was like, because he, he got injured early on in the last game, didn't he? So yeah. He had his number for the time, but his presence in both boxes really worries me because we're not, we, we, we don't concede a lot of goals from, from set pieces, but there's a lot of times where pl- the players win it and they just miss, like the opposition players will win a header because we'll, we do that blocking system. We don't man mark. So we've got yeah. like Laporte and the main centre house. And then we'll have like, we'll have Bernardo and Yerry Mina. I love Bernardo mm. trying to just block him. It's like he's a he, man mountain. He was happening against United when Maguire was just winning everything with his slab bed. But it's like we're putting Gundogan on him. Like, what are you yeah. doing? Get yeah. the port on him. Well, you know what I mean, but anyway, carry on. Well, what it's been. What it's been is like. Um, well, I, I'd, I'd love us. I'd love to see us do the same thing we did against Liverpool, which is we started with a back five to sort of help us against Salah and Mane. You know, those those three there, Godfrey Keane and, and Holgate, were brilliant in that game. Um, but Mason Holgate's been a bit erratic, so he, he might drop out. 
Uh, and Yeri Mina is a lot safer. And I love Yeri Mina. He's fantastic. He's like a cult hero. So I'd love to see him come back in. Uh, but first of all, I've got to worry about the goalkeeper because obviously Pickford's injured. Um, out with his rib Why injury. Is injured? Why Sorry. Is it, is it a rib injury? Yeah, yeah. I, when I watched match of the day, he just walks off and I was like, what's yeah. that? Landed awkwardly or something like it's a, injury, yeah. it's a recurrence of a rib injury um, that happened a few months ago, but he's got that again and he's going to be out for a few weeks, so he's he's that's why he's not being called to England today. Um, yeah. so obviously Pickford's out, Olsen, Robin Olsen, who I'm not sure if he started the game in the league, I, I don't think he did, but um, because um, it, when Bernardo scored. The third goal, it was Pickford. He didn't have a strong enough right hand. It went in the corner. Ah, just right, yeah. Um, at it, I think he started the the cup game just before that. I think yeah, it was. I think, I think he started against the Spurs. Yeah. So if Olsen's ready, I, th- I, I, you know, on our channel we've been reporting that he's he's not ruling out that he could be fit, but he had a bad injury. I think Robin Olsen and his house got robbed the other day, uh, which is absolutely horrible. So I don't know if if that's going to be like a, a you know a sort of a factor in him, whether he's going to play much you know because obviously there's there's other things you've got to think about but hopefully my my preferred team is going to be Robin Olsen in goal um, I'd like to see the back three of uh, Keane Mina and Godfrey with uh, I'd like to see Seamus Coleman come into the team um, because we played we played with uh, when. You know, when we were defending against Liverpool, we were a back five um, with yeah. the you know the five defenders. When we were going forward, it moved into more of a Dean was left back, Godfrey was right back, and Coleman pushed up into midfield. So I'd like to see us try that again. Um, obviously, Coleman and Dean as the two wing backs, Davis, uh, Alan, and hopefully, I don't know. It probably it's probably going to be Andre Gomez. Um, or Gilfie Sigurdsson, one of those two, and then Richarlison and Calvert Lewin up front. So five three two, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for. I'm not, but I'm really really not sure. As you said, me and Carlo, you know, he's always knocking on my door asking me for tactical <laughs> advice. So no, that that's what I hope we go for because we're gonna have to try and stay in the game and hit you with a counter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good system. I think that, and I think if you had Hammers in him, playing him like the number ten, you just have two double. Have a double pivot in front of the back three when mm. you're defending. I think that that would cause us a lot of issues because Hammers can unlock the door like he did against Liverpool with that cute little pass to Richarlison. Oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think you just go with those two at the top, don't you? Just try and ro- let them roam free. They've obviously got to press the centre half, but you you try and get in into the space behind the full back. And I'll, I'll come because that's where that's where the space is going to be. And United proved there's a blueprint there. And it's just whether. Obviously, Pep will learn, will and has probably learned from it because that's why we won three on the bounce. Like, so that that, that will be the area of concern. It's, it's just padding the box for you. Like, like that's what you did in the last game when you went with the back three. We couldn't get through you. Well, we were a few times when we got in behind at times. Like, Jesus actually played a few nice bits at the start. Sterling had um, Mina a few times, but it never. It looked like you know you were just on top of your keeper and we just couldn't, couldn't get through and we got lucky from a set piece that, that deflected in and then obviously that then sets the tone of the game you have to come out a bit more but anyway um, for my team so if you did go with the back five which I was thinking you probably might do just for security I think so Edison definitely I think five players that came off midweek were Diaz, Cancelo, Gundogan, Bernardo and Rodri so that's the midfield three our best fullback and our best centre half so I suspect that all five of them would play today because that would be the only reason to take them off relatively early. They all came off before 75, which is very unlike when he He always makes a stupid sub at like 88 minutes for like Prince Fernandinho on the phone for no reason. Um, so I'm I, I'm imagining that all three of them will play because that, that midfield three of Gundogan, Rodri and Bernardo's worked so well recently. Yeah. Like they were real European three. And I think that that's something I should have mentioned earlier that that's something, again, that we've they provide that all-roundness in the game, like we do, David and De Bruyne were amazing for those two years, but the thing was, it was reliant on Fernandino to turn up every game. Now we have that three that have a very European style and flavour to them because they can do the like army Swiss knives and can do everything. 
they can tackle, they can they can play, they can create goals, they can they they can hit intercepts, they can read the game, they can press really well. I think that's that three will be crucial for this weekend as well if we're going to have to break down a really low block of Everton. But defensively, I think Walker has to play. I think he has to play. And yeah. He played all game this week, but I think he, he's he's so important for that. And it's the, it's the type of game that he should play. It, Everton away, that type of just maybe it's just my naivety because he's a British player. It's just like he just he just performed better in that game for my eyes. Then it's, yeah, no, I can see where you're coming from with that. Yeah, I think uh, Diaz and Laporte. Uh, Stones won't play again, which I think would be strange because he was so good. But the thing is, whenever Cancelo plays left back, because he drifts inward, similarly to what you were saying about how you were shifting the back four whenever Coleman went up, whenever Cancelo plays left back, Laporte usually plays because he can. He, we usually go into a back three and he goes into midfield, either as that false eight where he, go, he operates as an attacking midfielder or drops in and build up with Rodri and it becomes a little pivot. Laporte can, is very comfortable out wide, he can, especially on the left-hand side, plus because of his left foot, he can just play yeah, the down left foot. Just going to add that yeah. guys. For, for the centre-back, he's, he's probably the best left-footed centre-back I've seen. Really yeah, good. He's, he's unbelievable. And the fact he can't get a game speaks volumes of how well Diaz and Laporte play. But Diaz played left centre-half in midweek. Where, I think that was the first time Cancelo played left-back and Laporte didn't play centre-half. And Diaz didn't look comfortable on the left-hand side. He played all right, but there were times where he didn't know whether to go or to, or to just hit it long, or to, to come back and play to Edison. And there were times where he, he ran down the line, and he was like, well, I'm going to have to cut back in, because I'm not confident with my left foot, like, I'm OK. But you have to cut back in, and then you're coming into bodies. So, you know, Diaz is brilliant at a lot of things, but he's, his progression with the ball, it is still learning, like, he's still learning that, like, cause he's, he's only here for, like, six, six nine months. Um, but I think it would be Laporte Cancelo, and I think it would be Rodri, Gundogan Bernardo, midfield, as I said. Because I think we we need that we'll need that midfield four, the the midfield the midfield three, and then Cancelo coming in to overload that box. And for me, I, th- I don't like playing a false nine against a back five. You've got to play De Bruyne. Like, I know we played all, but he looked hungry in the midweek. He looked he looked really up for it, and I hope that's a really good sign for him coming in because he's he's been in and out throughout the season. He's still been brilliant, but like West Ham, he like, was one of his worst games ever played in the city shirt. So I think De Bruyne down the middle, Foden on the left. Foden has to play. Foden just has to play every big game. He's, oh, he's yeah. so... He's a terrific player. Like shocking that. how good he is. Like he's 20 years old. When Pep leaves, he'll be 22. And he's going to have had five or six years on the Pep in the first team. It, it's just crazy. Like, it's just crazy how good he is. And he, it's like mad. the fact that a 20-year-old... It's mad to think... Like, stop off playing... On in this side is insane but he just makes the difference he just he just constantly makes the difference he's, he's there's, apart from De Bruyne there's no one with that t- type of aggression or that type of brilliant dribbling like Sterling's close but it's especially in central areas Foden just like the goal that he created in the in midweek I don't know if you saw it just taking the ball on the halfway line just driving at a team and it just puts everyone on the back foot and we need that especially against a team where they're going to sit deep we need to push players back to create space on the edge of the box if the ball bounces for a second ball. And it, it, Foden's one of those few players that really pushes a back line back because he can hit the byline. With players like Mares, while he played brilliantly in the game last time, because he, he comes inside, it, it's easy to sort of telegraph him. It's easy to sort of shuffle across and put men near him. He doesn't hit the byline in them. And if you've got him to do that, then make, then yeah. And he's been in real form of late, Mares. But Just, uh... for me... Sorry, Robert. Sorry. Just touching on Foden there from an outside point of view. Um, it's mad to think. So, say, he's 20 years old. Yeah. So, he's the same age as me, um, which yeah. is a crazy, <laughs> crazy thing to think. And I remember when he first started to sort of get a sniff under Pep. A few years ago, it was, I think it was the season where you got 100 points or whatever. Um, yeah, and I remember it was like, it was like, all right, Pep, Pep, play this lad, and he wouldn't play him. And it's mad to think he was about seventeen. No wonder yeah. he didn't play him. Like that's what that's what the fans were saying. It's like we've got David Silva, Bernardo Silva, De Bruyne, Gundogan, Fernandinho. Where's he going to play this lad? He's, he's eighteen, unless he was Messi. Like, like which he is honestly, <laughs> mate. Like, yeah. No. 
Like that's it, what everyone forgot. Everyone just thought because Pep plays kids. And that's yeah. what he, and you know, it went to like in overdrive. It's like, why aren't you playing this youngster? Why are you playing all these players that you've bought for 50 million? You throw, you know what I mean? It's like, well, he's 18. Like, send him out alone. It's like, what's he going to do? Eight, eight, 18. He's gonna, he was a really scrawny lad as well, naturally, because of how young yeah. he was. He just went to the championship. He would have just got kicked the crap out of <laughs> playing for like Blackburn or something. Yeah. <laughs> it would have improved him anything. You and know, now he's staying in this team, aggressive. Now he's like. <laughs> One like a really important part of Guardiola's side that could go on to win the Champions League, will go on to win the Premier League, could do the quadruple in theory, and he's only twenty years old. Like that's that's unbelievable. Like yeah, it's just people yeah. forget that people think he's like twenty five or something. Not yeah, that. yeah. People think he's like twenty two or something. People think he's like he's you know it's him and Mason Greenwood like. And you, you think compare this to Mason, Mason Greenwood for United? It seems like he's getting so much responsibility on his shoulders to turn up and play well in those games. But like for Foden, he's he's had that time to progress in the side. Obviously, we have a better team than United, but like you know, he has he's he's been integrated so brilliantly from Pep, mm. and I don't think he get he's getting credit for it because it's it's naturally going all on Foden's natural ability. But Pep has done brilliantly. Just he's not put a lot of pressure on him to get in this game, and he's still telling. He still comes out and says he's not he's nowhere near finished. He's still got loads to improve, and City fans know that. But the thing that I see every time is he is such a goal threat, and we don't even though we score crap tons of goals, we miss a lot of chances. He always gets shots on target, it's, yeah. it, and he's always in a good area, like he was when he scored against Jola. That that shot with his right foot was going in the corner because I watched the highlights today, and that's going in the corner before it gets deflected. But like creating chances. And like in the Southampton game, he was in a, he was in a great area to receive the cross. Zinchenko forces the keeper into a good save because it, you know. And the Chelsea goal where he doesn't even see, doesn't even look, and he just curls it in the near post. He just has that ability which you think someone like De Bruyne doesn't really have. I know he pinged one in top bins in midweek, but he doesn't have that type of natural ability to score because he's he's an unbelievable creator. And Foden just for me has to start. Yeah, and like it, I, it, you know. There's so much talent. It's, it, it, it's difficult for him to get consistent games, but every time he comes on, it's like, why is he not playing? Just play him every game. He's so good. <laughs> it makes you think, like, if he does go on to be, which I'm sure he will, if he does go on to be this world-beaten uh, number 10 or whatever whatever his, his position ends up being, because I know he can play quite a few, and he ends up, you know, winning Ballon d'Ors and winning Champions Leagues and everything. It, how much of that would, like, would be down to Pep Guardiola because a lot of managers would just send him out on loan, put him to the back of the line, make him earn his place in the squad. But Guardiola, yeah, Guardiola obviously saw this lad has a lot of potential and played the way he wanted. And he's, you know, nurtured him. He's, and I remember he used to play him down all the time. I was always getting told, watch this lad, Phil Foden, coming through for City. He's the next big thing. He's fantastic. Yeah. And... I remember he used, every time I'd look at Guardiola, Guardiola wouldn't talk about him. He just wouldn't wouldn't mention him. He's not in the squad. He's not getting mentioned. He'd be well, on he the he bench. He'd say like, he'd say, he, the, the famous thing he said was that he's the most gifted player he's seen at that age. And obviously everyone's like, well, he had Messi. But like when he got when he got to um, Barcelona, Messi was twenty one. Was, yeah, he wasn't eighteen. He wasn't seventeen. Um, Iniesta was like. Mid twenties, Xavi was mid twenties. He he's not played that that, and he got blown out of proportion because he'd managed Messi, and Messi's the greatest player ever. So, you know, and he he does that thing where he he bigs up a lot of players. But I get what you mean. He, just, he never got caught in that sort of or embroiled in the conversation to always play him. He always knew what he was doing, and you know because he is a genius, because he's an absolutely unbelievable manager. And you know, he, but you've got to give credit to Foden as well because he wanted to stay. He, mm. cause, and I think that's because he's, he's a city lad, so he, it does mean a bit more for him. But we coming through the academy, it was always talked about that age group which Foden was in. I even remember going on like city tours. I can't remember what year it was, but it was like the under fourteens or fifteens. And the guy that was saying it was like, "That's the team you need to watch out for." And you think when we got to the youth cup final with that team. You know, they had Brahim Diaz, Jaden Sancho, and Phil Foden. That was the mm-hmm. front three with uh, Lucas Nemecha. And you think it was like, Jesus, some of these players. Are... And Foden looked really good. And I think he scored in the game that I was there for. Um, but Sancho was really. And Brahim Diaz looked like the best player. Mm-hmm. And you think, 
But both of them, Brahim Diaz wanted wanted to move because he, he thought he'd get more game time elsewhere and went to Real Madrid and that didn't really happen. But he's doing well at Milan. And obviously Jane and Sancho, we wanted Sancho to stay. Like we gave him loads of we were gonna make him the he was only 17 or something, 18, and we were gonna give him the most he was gonna be the most expensive 18-year-old in, in terms of wages in the world. And he turned it down because he didn't think he'd get the game time. But he was 18, as we were saying about Foden, and Leroy Sane, Raheem Sterling, and Mara is inside. Like I, you know, what eighteen-year-olds can get in, and obviously it looks like we've made a bit of a bit of an error in terms of Sancho might become one of the best wingers, you know, the past ten years. But you know, those three wingers at the time were yeah, you got to put insane. it in context, haven't you? You've yeah, got, so it's easy to say City dropped a clang and let them go to Dortmund, but you know, Leroy Sané at the time was oh, what a player he was for City at, at that point. Like, and he's obviously moved on to onto Bayern Munich now, and Sterling was. You know, it the, the years seem to escape Sterling because I feel like he's been around for years, don't you? But um, yeah. I remember, like you know, at at that point, like it would have been hard to put all your faith in in for Pep to put his faith in like 17, 18 year old Jaden Sancho and be like, yeah, this lad's the next big thing, like he did with Foden, but Foden was just a bit more patient, I think. Yeah, because we didn't put a lot of pressure on them. That was the thing. I, and I don't think it was Mares that was, I think it was Bernardo that came in. And then that was like the straw about the camel's back, I think. Because that was, the, that was the year he went when we bought Bernardo. Um, but yeah, you just you can't put that type of responsibility on a team that's trying to win the Champions League and the Premier League. How many teams do that with an 18 year old in the side that isn't like a Messi or an Mbappe or a Haaland? You know, it's just, it's not. It's not normal to expect that from a manager, like just just so you can sort of beat them with the head for not playing kids. It no. just, you know. But um, no, I, I would agree. I, I think it's just a clangor in terms of like he, he, how good he is now. You know, it's it is it's a shame that we did let him go. But Foden's bi- bided his time. He's he's decided to stay here, and he, he could have easily forced the move. But he signed the contracts and he, he and got a big extension. He probably will get another one. And, you know, we can only hope that he stays if he becomes a one-club man and plays it and becomes the player he could be. Because he is, he is our gas going. That's what he, he yeah. is. He, he, he's that, it's the player that, when we got bought, because we, the ideal player, like, sorry to ramble on, so I apologise to everyone. No, 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 no problem, no problem. Um, but, like, when we, when we were in the, like, the lower echelons of the, of the Premier League and uh, the lower divisions, we had Sean Wright Phillips, who was like one of our best players we produced in, in donkey's years. And you think, because the club, club was run so terribly, we had this brilliant young player, but we had to let him go. We, had, we, we got 20 million from Chelsea. Honestly, mate, like, sorry to interrupt you, but it's 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 Wayne Rooney at Everton. It's, it's yeah. the exact same story. We had this 16-year-old lad, came through, absolute world beater at the time. I was, and it's funny because I was actually talking with him because I, I missed Rooney. Um, I was, a, I'm a bit too young to remember his, his peak at Everton when he first came through. But uh, my dad talks about him as like this lad came through. I remember watching him in a youth cup game against Villa, and it was like Gabby Agbonlahor was playing for Villa and stuff like that. And it was like, it was like this lad Wayne Rooney was the most talented player. The he said the only he said for him. Uh, he, he said, at Goodison, uh, the most talented player he's ever saw play at Goodison was Ronaldo when he played in a friendly for Brazil's under 18s or something when he was really young. And he said, like, the only players who sort of topped that, who get into that sort of level, was like Ibrahimovic at Man United. Um, because you could tell, he's, even though he was old, he still had that un- undeniable quality. But Rooney falls into that, that category for him. And it, it just reminds you of it. We were, we were at the time, we were floating around mid table. Um, I think we just finished like 17th or something, either the season before or the season before that. We've just, just escaped, not just escaped relegation because we were clear of it, but still we were 17th in the league. And I think it was Moy's first season. And this lad Rooney came through and we just couldn't turn down the offer from United for him. And that sounds a lot like what you're saying there with Wright Phillips. And thankfully, that's not the case anymore with City. They can keep players like that if they want to stay. That's the crux of what I was coming down to. And yeah, Rooney's an, another great example because that type of money, you can't turn it down. Like, in, no. uh, when did he go to United? Was it 2000? It was similar time, 2000, ago, wasn't it? It was like 2006. 2004. Oh, it was 2004. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, like, I think it must have been the same summer then, because I think that's when he went to, because it was Mourinho that bought Shawnee. Mm. So, yeah, the same summer. So, that's like the money. And um, I would make a joke about United spending loads of money, but I can't be bothered. But like, <laughs> so, uh, that, the ability to keep those players now and keep Foden, because if we were where we were last time, we had Foden, he would have gone. He would yeah, have been no, definitely. So, definitely. The circumstance of the club. And now, because we've put so much money into the academy, and while it, on one level it becomes like a factory farm, you're basically just creating loads of talent, and then you'll for you know you're pulling them off for like ten to fifteen million. If you do mm. that for ten players, you put one hundred and fifty million in the bank just for players that haven't even played in the first team. The first team, yeah. how the inflation is now. But when you've got that gem, when you've got your Messi, your Mbappe, your Haaland, your Ronaldo, your Rooney, you, they're there for you. Then you just keep them on a big contract, and they can't go. Mm. and that's what as long as you want to stay of course as well and we've done really well a lot with contracts in terms of like keeping the big players staying and obviously there, there was a thing with Stern at the moment which is a bit worrying if it is true like because obviously there's apparently a spat with him and Guardiola because he's not played for the last three games like he came on against Mujer got back fortunately but he hasn't started the last three games and he's one of our best players and I'm hoping he starts this weekend he was going to be my last player I hope he starts right wing but I, I, I think it might be Mahrez or he could be still up front of his own. But having that player and just being able to keep him on a contract is such a game changer because, as you say, it's massive for the club as well. I always felt when we were in the early stages of the, the, the when we got to go, but it was just about winning the trophies. It was just about winning because we've never seen, like 2011 was a massive, it was an unbelievable moment yeah. with that trophy. As I imagine what, for Everton fans, when you do win a trophy, it is such a big thing. And it sort of clouds your judgment and you sort of like, and also with United and they just pontificate about playing youngsters all the time. So it does get on your nerves and you just sort of like, it doesn't, it's not the be all the end all like having that because it's about winning, it's about winning trophies and creating a legacy in the club and having those moments. But Foden, it, it does, it does hit different. It is seeing a player like that, who you know is from your local area and he is, yeah. he's someone that could have gone to the same school as you or you could have played in a Sunday league or something. And he's playing with Kevin De Bruyne and Sterling and Mahrez, and he's up to the level. He's creating the chances still. He's not like he's not shrouding away. He's not hiding in the corner. He's getting on the ball. He's making things happen. And he's only twenty, so it's only the first part of his of his journey. It's just it is incredible, and it is it's a brilliant place for the club, and it's a brilliant obviously the club are in a really really good place at the moment. So, yeah. Foden typifies that that ability oh. to bring through the because we've been getting that over sorry to, but no, we're getting no, that over our head. When are you going to start bringing through the academy players? When are you going to you know, you've got one of the best academies in Europe and all you ever do is spend 100 million every summer. And it, it will happen. We will have more academy players coming in the team. We've got some really good youngsters coming out now. But Foden has always been always been talked about along with Sancho. But I know we've got Sancho, but like that, that, those players were like, these are the players you've got to watch out for. Yeah, I majority of the... Well, even when you do have such a fantastic academy, majority of your players aren't going to make it into the first team because you won't win... Um, you know, to quote a, a famous manager, you don't win anything with kids. Um, yeah. And it's like, but you, it, it's, you're not going to win league titles with 11, 18 year olds in the side. It's impossible. You will not do it. No, There's yeah. not that experience there. You will get a diamond in the rough every five or six years. And that'll be your Phil Foden or be your Wayne Rooney. Yeah. The rest of the, t- the rest of the players will drop down a league or they'll drop down a few levels and they'll play there and they'll be fine. But it's it's sometimes it can be one in a hundred that are going to make it into a team like Cities because if you've got the money, spend it, and if, you know that's how you're going to win trophies because you can't just be promoting youth for the sake of promoting youth because you probably exactly. won't win, you won't be as successful. But yeah, um, yeah, it's no, I, yeah, I do admire it, and that's why when, when United fans talk about the class of '92 and all that, but the thing was they had a world class team. When those players started coming in, because it was only like Gary Neville and Giggs that really got into the side, you know, Beckham had to wait his side. I think Beckham broke into the side when he was like 21 or something, but I could be wrong. But like it was only Giggs and Neville that broke in really early when they were younger. And everyone else had to wait and bide the time. But they had they spent a lot of money on some really good players who'd already won trophies. They'd already won the league and the Cup and his Cup and the FA Cup. They'd already created that winning culture in the club. And yeah. then the youngsters got led in. That's how you do it. They, there's this whole narrative and this myth that the kids came in and that was what changed it for them. It was like, no, 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 no. It was the brilliant players of Cantona and uh, McAllister and Robson and Bruce. Schmeichel. And- Schmeichel. Those are the players. 
and it was the youngsters that came in after and re-energised the team, but they still bought and got good players because that's how that's how you have to. Teams you absolutely have to. And You've got to buy good players. In England, you might be able to do it in Spain, like La Masia and stuff like that. You might be able to do it in Spain. Yeah, with, yeah but, yeah. you know, it, you well, never got... You're never going to change it by bringing in like five kids from the academy. It doesn't work. It's like you'll spot one fantastic player, but you have to have a good squad and you'll bring in that one player and they'll yeah. turn into a world beater. That's that's how academies work. But unless you've got anything else to add, Rob, about, you know, anything more to add football-wise, I'll, I'll go on to my last question because we always end it with a non-football related question. Oh, uh, yeah, I remember the celebrity one last time caught me off guard. Yeah, <laughs> caught you off guard. But I've got a bit of an easier one, bit of an easier one for you there this time. What's your favourite film and why? Oh, I, uh, good question. Well, I studied film at uni, so this is a... Uh, yeah, I I did a, I did GCSE film in, in high school, and that was about as far as I went, but I, I love films. Oh, there you go. Uh, well, I look forward to hearing your favourite film, but mine is a film called Memento. Christopher mm. Nolan's first American film. Right. Um, um, so it's basically, it's about um, a, a husband with short-term memory loss trying to find out who killed his wife. But it's it starts halfway through the film, or it starts at the end and finishes at the beginning. Because it, yeah. it, each chunk, it sort of like, it sort of creates that displacement you have where you can't track your memories. You can't track the chronology of the story because it's all like discombobulating you as the character is. And I just thought, I just thought that was genius when I first saw it when I was like, I don't know, like 15 or something or whatever, 14. And I was there like, this is just like, I still don't fully comprehend what's going on, but I'm just so engaged and it's so, the performances are so brilliant. Guy Pearce is outstanding. Mm. And just the intrigue of the story and the, and the twists and turns, and the, it's got an amazing ending or middle, whatever it is. Um, and it, it was my first sort of realisation how amazing films could be. And then I was sort of like, expanded upon with like Dead Poets Society for example or Seven Samurai by Kurosawa yeah and that was the but Memento all started for me that was like the film where I was like wow this is insane and then Chris Nolan's been one of my favorite directors ever since yeah so I just think the first place for me of appreciating the complexity of the film I think that was that was one well what's yours you well just before we go on to mine I just want to ask you I was going to ask as you, as you said there Nolan's one of your favorite directors um so you're a fan of his, his, his more newer ones, like the Dark Knight trilogy, okay. Tenet, stuff like that? Um, I think I think he, Tenet was such a disappointment because that, for me, that's the first bad film he's ever made. Every other film is just, it's just a work of art. And I know, I don't want to like pontificate too much about it because there are so many great directors with different visions. And I know Chris Nolan has his haters, but... I just think from the following, which is a great early UK film, this is his first stab at it, like in feature length. I think Insomnia, amazing film. If no one's seen it, it's a remake of a Nordic noir. It's a great film. The Dark Knight trilogy is outstanding. Inceptions, yeah. one of the best experiences I've ever had at a cinema was watching Inception. Same yeah. as in Interstellar. Interstellar was absolutely incredible. Prestige, a brilliant film. Two brilliant performances from Jack, Hugh Jackman and um, Christopher, um, Christine Bale. And Dunkirk is just an amazing film, like just an amazing film. And I was so disappointed with Tenet. It was, it was one step too far in my opinion. Maybe if I watch it another time, it might be all right. But yeah, I think I, I, that's the only miss he's had. I think all the other films are so brilliant, and you can take something from them in whatever way you can. But how about you? What, what's your favourite? Yeah, film I've, director? I've got a handful. Mine, are, mine seem to be like a top five that seem to switch you all the time. But I've always settled on Goodfellas, Martin Scorsese's. Hmm. It seems to be my one that I constantly, every time I revisit it, it never gets boring to me. I love it. I love any, I, I like gangster films anyway, but um, this story, like Henry and he grows up and Jimmy and Tommy and, and all the different characters and so many iconic moments. Uh, the characters are fantastic. Um, I wasn't a fan of the Irishman though. I, I don't know why. I just could never really, never really got into it. And, no, I, to be honest mate, I just, I don't know, it, it sort of felt a bit too much like a rip-off without that, that you know, it, it yeah. felt inexplicably Martin Scorsese. And I love Scorsese as a filmmaker. I love, like, Shuttered Island as well. It's a brilliant film. But, like, 
Yeah, I, th- I think I've always settled on on Goodfellas as as being my favourite one. Every time I f- every time I watch it, yes, shut it's my Apple Watch going off there telling me about Shuttered Island. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, it, I always settle on it as I can watch this film, and every time I s- it's weird because I put it on, and immediately I can watch the whole thing. It, it's like it just I, it has this stay in power with me in the same way like The Empire Strikes Back does. Um, yeah, brilliant. I'm, 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 but apart from like that crop of Scorsese films or Tarantino films, like I love Inglorious Bastards, Reservoir Dogs. I really liked, I really liked Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. That, that, that was one of my favorite. No, I was, I was a massive fan of it, you know, and it, um, I really liked it. So apart from those, like that crop of films that you'd say, these are films that will stand the test of time forever. Um, outside of that, I'm a proper nerd with films. I love anything with superheroes in. I love, oh, yeah, yeah, I love Star Wars. I'm re I'm what rewatching all the Star Wars again at the moment. I just absolutely love it. Um, Snyder, Cut, um, Snyder Cut's getting released today. Like, yeah. fair enough, it's the first one I'm going to watch after this because it's on Sky Cinema. Four hours. Oh, is it? It's yeah, on Sky. Right, yeah. Do you know what, mate? I've been I've been looking for a way to watch that, and you've just you've just sorted my night out there, nice one. I, I was just I was just about to look for a way to watch it because I know obviously in America it's blew up on it, and there's like Jared Leto's Joker seems to be a completely different character in this one to what he was yeah. in like because I hated him in like Suicide Squad and that. I hated okay. Leto's Joker. I love. <laughs> That's Go a butchered on. film, isn't it? I think if it was yeah. new, what David, if David Ayer was promised what he wanted to do, it could have been a good film, but they just butchered it, like like they did with Justice League. And I know they yeah. did for but and Josh Trank's Fantastic Four. Just just oh. stick with the vision. If it doesn't yeah. work, it doesn't work. And I know they've got to make the money, but no. making a black new film, it's just so what? <laughs> no, I absolutely. But apart from that, uh, I love Raimi Spider Man. That's my favourite. Raimi Spider Man. I've actually got a Spider Man tattoo. Uh, there. Oh, really? uh, I'm, I'm, you can see him there as well. I've got like a, a Spider Man thing. Oh, I don't know if it'll be. I don't know if it'll be available for the people on YouTube because I might be cut out in like a little box. But um, Sam Raimi Spider Man. I love how there's that like that bit of cheesy eighties horror, like Evil Dead. Because obviously he's, he's famous for doing Evil Dead. I love that. Yeah. Um, and all oh. the all the extras that like point and it's fine. yeah oh yeah mate it it's cringe and funny enough that was one of the films I just because my uh, I loved superheroes growing up um, I loved Batman Superman Spider Man all of them but like the classic ones really but uh, that was what that was my like that was my GCSE sort of module in in uh, in in high school that that was okay. This for your GCSEs, you are superhero films. Watch as many superhero films as you can. Um, study them. So I was like, you know, 70s Superman, <laughs> Sam Raimi, Spider-Man, Dark Knight trilogy, everything like that. And then um, remember me GCSE being on uh, the, sev- the the original Superman. I think it's 77. Oh, right. I think it was 70, 75, 77, something like that. 78, that's it. And... Um, with the bit where he's in the phone box and he's, you know, spins around and that, that was it. Oh. But I, yeah, I absolutely love, but like, uh, no, going back to justice league there, I was so, so disappointed with Jared's left Jared Leto's one, because I loved in, I loved the soundtrack to suicide squad. It's a really good soundtrack. I understand how they wanted to change him a little bit, but the only stand up for me is that bit where he's in, um, he wrote all over the walls and he sat down and there's all the knives around him. I love that shot where it's sort of like a, a moves out shot and it's like a bird's eye one. That was the only good thing about it for me. I really like that bit. But like uh, Birds of Prey as well. I thought that was okay. It's sort of really... No, it, it's decent. It's... it's they, were, they needed to make a solo Harley Quinn film because it, she... Yeah. Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn was one of the only, for me, one of the only saving things about the DCEU. Like, uh, I wasn't, Henry Cavill is a good Superman, in my opinion. Yeah, but Ben Affleck as Batman, he's just, I just think he's too old. I just would have liked them to go with like a younger guy, in my opinion, but, and it's like, uh, I think that's going to be, that's going to be a really good film. Yeah, I think think it's it's going to, yeah, it's going to be more like a, 
like a standalone thing like Joker was, where it's going to be, okay, yeah. darker tone. We're going to really make a film out of this. It's yeah. going to be like a, a bit in the way yeah, the Dark Knight was. It's going to be like when he when he first comes onto the scene, sort of like Batman Begins, but yeah. But I think he's only that brutality of like Arkham Asylum type thing, where he's gonna like you see it in the trailer where he just absolutely annihilates this guy. Oh <laughs> like, mate, yeah, and the Riddler's guys all come out and he's uh, yeah. I think I think it's two year old Batman that um that they're going for like he, he's been Batman for two years and they were filming it in Liverpool recently. Yeah, which just oh mate, it was amazing. I was coming home from work every day. Because uh, I work in the city centre, and I was coming home from work every day, and I was going through the film set on the bus. Oh, oh mate! And there was all the Warner Brothers vans out. There was one point where they had a big rain machine uh, on top of St George's Hall because it was Gotham City Hall and all that. Um, but going back to it's going like talking about the Joker there. You mentioned Arkham Asylum. Mark Hamill is just it, my favourite Joker. Like, oh, hands crazy. down, hundred percent like. Probably- Gotta be Heath Ledger. Yeah, I, I understand people people talking about Heath Ledger, and I seen a tweet yesterday about um, what's your top four favorite movie villains. And in terms of movie villains, yeah, Heath Ledger's my favorite movie Joker. But mm. I just think Mark Hamill when he gets on the mic, he just brings that. He just brings that sinister. He just defines Killer Clown for me. He's just amazing. But um, yeah, play. I, I I put it off, but I did play all the Arkham games recently. Absolutely loved every minute of it, which is fantastic. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I played the first two. I can't remember what the third one was, but like the second one, because it's the second one, Arkham City. Yeah, and that second one's like, that. And the third one's like, Arkham Knight. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't think I played the third one. Arkham City took a lot out of me. So I just, because I'm not, I was never really into games. Like I loved Arkham Asylum, but mm. Arkham City was one of them where you like, you really got to invest time in it. And I just sort of like, got it done over the line but like i was sort of, yeah i was getting near the end of like my sort of gaming years so yeah i, 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 heard, I heard good things about the third one but it, what it's apparently uh, not as good as the first two. the third one is just a massive like a massive thing it's like you have got if you want to get the full experience like i completed just the main thing but like if you want to get the full experience you've got to do there's like there's like a side mission for every batman villain it's it's insane there's about 20 different paths you can go down on these different these different stories. And I'm like, I love the game, but I'm not I'm not willing to put that much time into it. Like, like obviously there is people out there who do it and stuff like that. But yeah, um, massive superhero guy. Like, and Star Wars as well. I love Star Wars and, and stuff like that. So um, but yeah, that it's honestly, Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's just yeah, it's, so, it's great. It's, it's, nice chat. It's, yeah, it's all always a nice chat. Exactly the same as when we met last time for the um you know, for the league game. It's yeah, it's always yeah. a good chat. We're just it's just good talking about football with someone and it's nice. I, I, yeah, I like speaking to city fans as well. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, if you ever want me on again, more yeah, than happy. It's definitely as always. And of course, guys, if if you want to see more of if City, go and check out City Extra brilliant uh brilliant channel lots of content over there um decent amount of subs i think you're on 22k subs now aren't you over on city extra no 100 100 100. so i'm i'm gone completely yeah i've been obviously been talking for too long mate but um (laughs) you go check out city extra massive and you know for for the for the club with no fan channels rob you're doing quite well aren't you (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they're doing all right, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. But no, yeah, definitely go check check Rob out. Go check him out on Twitter as well. Some great views over on yeah. there. But yeah. Um but if you have enjoyed the video, make sure you like it. Um we've been going this is the longest opposition view I've ever done. But do you know what, guys? Put it on, stick your headphones in, swerve that film you were gonna put on tonight. And just <laughs> sit there and listen to this because we, we've yeah we've we've just spoke for ages about about football and that that's what the channel is for really that's what fan channels are for but as I said guys make sure you subscribe to the channel go and subscribe to City Actors as well make sure you like the video check us both out on Twitter and um, thanks for watching we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>